Hello, and welcome to this eSchool Media webcast. My name is Andrew Barber, and I'm a senior contributing editor here at eSchool Media. I'm going to be acting as the moderator for today's presentation, which is sponsored by It's Learning. And over the next hour, we're going to look at the important opportunities that exist in the first days of the school year that can help students develop the tools and support networks that they need throughout the school year. And before I introduce our speakers for today, let me just take a few moments to discuss uh, some elements about the console that you're going to be looking at today. And first, the event will be recorded, so you don't have to worry about taking notes or anything like that. Uh, we're going to send you an email in a couple of days uh, that will contain a link to the recorded event, and you're also going to be able to download a PDF of the presentation from that same email. <coughs> And second, please ask questions. You know, don't feel as if you have to wait until the end at any time during the presentation. If you have a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your console and hit the Submit button. And I hope we'll have about 10 minutes or so at the end when our speakers can answer your questions. We also have a chat function, which can be launched by that blue group chat icon down at the bottom of your screen. Use chat to talk among yourselves or to contact me or the eSchool Media team you know, if you have technical issues, for instance. But uh, do me a favor, please. Don't use the chat to ask our panelists questions. Uh, they simply aren't going to have time to monitor the chat. So if you have a question for them, please use the Q&A panel instead. And with that out of the way, let me introduce our speakers for today. Uh, Alan November is an international leader in educational technology and was named one of the U.S.'s most influential thinkers of the decade by Tech and Learning magazine. Alan's most recent book, Who Owns the Learning, made the New York Times education bestseller list. And Alan has worked with schools and universities in 40 countries to improve learning through innovative practice. Uh, he also leads the globally acclaimed Building Learning Communities Conference and is the founder of November Learning, an education consultancy. And then at the end of Alan's presentation, we'll also hear briefly from Jill Davis, who's the marketing manager for content and social media at It's Learning. So welcome, Alan and Jill. It's a real honor to have you here today. Uh, Alan, why don't you get us started? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's an honor for me to be invited. I, I love this, uh, particularly the first five days. I mean, if you poll teachers, they, there's huge agreement that how you start the school year uh, can make or break the year. Now, five days is somewhat of a random <clears throat> number. So think of it as first five days leads to first five weeks, leads to first five months, and so on. So the, the general idea here is to... Um, Front load skills as early as upfront as possible that really has the best investment leading towards uh, academic success. So off we go. First, I'd like to start with some polls. I'm very curious what the audience thinks. So, Andrew, maybe you can help me sort this, um, sure. give the audience some direction on how to fill out this poll. Would that be all right? Yeah, sure. No, so I'm, I'm interested in, or... yeah, the skills that sure. – that people on online think are the most important for the first five days of, of the school year? Okay, so the audience members just need to pick one of those and hit the submit button, and then in a moment we will see, you know, the results of what everyone in the audience thinks. <clears throat> I think that's probably, probably Alan, about enough time for everyone to have a chance to put it in. So if you want to move uh, it on to the next answer. one. Yeah. Wow. Look at this. Okay, so memorize is not so good. <laughs> that's, i got to find out who those 3% are. Um, so asking good questions is way up. Um, and working in teams, self-assessment. Well, that's good because that's what we're going to be focused on today um, and finding their own answers. Those bottom four actually do fascinate me. So I'm sure people will have questions on this too. I'm going to do the best I can to add some value uh, to where most people already are. So that, that is, that's a good thing. Let's do another one. Um, 
this next question is in there's actually two parts. This is part one of two questions. This one is currently, it should say, who works harder in class during the first five days? And you select one. And the next question after this one is who should work harder? So th this is a comparison question, and this is the first of the comparison. And Andrew, you can give me another heads up on when to hit the go button. Yeah, well, I, I think that since there are only three three options there, I think you probably uh, to, for the audience just hit hit pick one and hit submit. And and Alan, I think you can probably move on to the We're go. result. Of okay. This. So currently, teachers work harder by far. Oh my gosh, look at this. Um, balance twenty five percent, seventy three. That is fascinating. All right, let's go to the next, the paired one. Who should work harder? I'm going to make a note on that. 76. And we can always come back to that, Alan, if you want to at some point. We can come back to those results. If uh oh. You want to, you know, switch back and forth. Great, Andrew. Thanks. But, uh, so, yep, I think All once right. again, I think we'll uh, move on. We can go on. So it looks like it's the opposite. So roughly, uh, there's a feeling out there that students should work harder, that we're out of balance. Um, and I agree. I, I am convinced, if I, <laughs> given what I've seen um, from, from university all the way down, that, that I'm just going to take the approach that generally students should be working harder Who's ever talking is probably learning more um, in that the general approach here is for teachers to talk less and listen more and for students to do a lot of the work. So it lines up with uh, the direction the audience wants to go toward. So hopefully what we'll cover today are some approaches where you can make this happen. Students working harder than teachers. Yay. Okay, so I've got these three R's uh, on the first five days. It's about relationships, building the right culture of relationships. It's about encouraging students to take risk because in, in many ways I've watched classrooms all over the world. As I think a lot of people will probably agree, a lot of students who need help and should be taking risks somehow are not always doing that. Uh, either concerned about what their friends will think or they're too embarrassed or they don't even know how far behind they are to even ask a question. And I have responsibility to that, that, that they're, you know, this has to do with students working harder, that the general question is how much control of what teachers do can we give to kids? And what is the balance of responsibility of managing learning for the year that ought to start in the first in the first five days. So those are my three R's, and uh, just a little bit more detail. It's it's all about learning how to learn. Uh, you know, this is the age-old debate about the balance between content and skills. Probably going back before Socrates. Probably go forward another couple thousand years. So we're not going to answer that question today, but I would rather lean towards skills than content. So I just want my, my approach out there so people understand where I'm coming from. So you can defend yourself if you think you should. But my sense is there's so much content available on the web today and just through theory that skills, I believe, are going to become increasingly important over time because content is at your fingertips, and we don't have to memorize as much. So tapping the imagination and asking questions and so forth, I think these are some of the most important learn-to-learn -learn skills. And, and so off we go. Um, I'm starting with day one. And, and by the way, I'm just going to tell people I've made this stuff up. So you decide what you think is important in the first five days. But I'm just hoping what I can present is a good enough to criticize logical sequence 
um, that if you're really going to re-engineer students working harder than teachers or more balanced, as, as the poll suggested, that, that these might be good things to do. So I'm very influenced by people who ask interesting questions and students who ask interesting questions. But when I was, a t I was a teacher for about 12 years, and that's what got me excited, when kids would ask the most fascinating questions, because to me it was a sign that they were thinking. So what if we can develop some frameworks to teach teachers to get kids to ask a lot more questions? especially with online tools like It's Learning. I just think it's, we have the tools now that we've never had before, and we have some processes. So I'm going to tell you, I've been influenced by two groups, and e each of these is days-long workshop by itself. But I'm, I'm very influenced by Dan Rothstein at the Right Question Institute, and we're going to go into some of Dan's work in a moment. And I'm very influenced by Jamie McKenzie, who has this uh, questioning toolkit. And, and between the two, uh, these, these folks can really empower teachers to empower kids to ask powerful questions. Uh, so my day one is teaching kids to ask questions. I'm also influenced by that. The other reason um, that I think this is so important is I spent a day with a guy named Stephen Wolfram. And Stephen Wolfram invented uh, Wolfram Alpha, which is a powerful knowledge engine. And he's, he's a genius behind algorithm, search algorithms. And, you know, it's amazing what you can do with Wolfram Alpha, getting content, like any math problem, all the steps, balancing any chemical equation, and on and on and on. It's just fascinating now what answers you can get if you really are sophisticated about getting your answers. So at the end of the day, I, my mind was so blown. I, I asked Stephen, and by the way, there's a great TED Talk by Stephen Wolfram I highly recommend for educators, and another TED Talk by Conrad Wolfram, his brother. Uh, they're both British mathematicians who are absolutely at the genius level. So I asked Stephen, if all this content is available on the Internet, What's the single most important skill we should be teaching students? And he did not hesitate. He said, whoever asks the most interesting questions are going to be ahead because content's available. But if you don't know what question to ask, it doesn't matter that the content's available. You'll never get to it. So it, it kind of fascinates me. It's kind of like Socrates meets the Internet. So let, let's, get, let's get some depth into this thing. The Right Question Institute has these four steps, which you know anyone can read here. Um, I've seen this in, in operation. It's fascinating. Uh, if, you, if you prompt kids with a photograph or a video or, a, or a, a, an equation, a quote, a primary source document, you know teachers pick some content that will stimulate uh, questions even without understanding what it's all about. You'll, you'll have a question if you see a painting or a photograph or, or a quote, and you just generate questions, lots of questions. And, any time, and students have to, have to take notes, uh, preferably in teams, and just keep asking one question after another. And if you, do, if you start the school year by getting kids to ask questions without teaching them content, then there's no judgment. They know they're not supposed to know the answers because the teacher hasn't told them anything yet. So that fascinates me that kids approach this without any sense of, of being judged because it's the first day of school or the first day of a unit. Uh, well, the other thing that fascinates me is when I've seen it and I've actually participated in this process, this question formulation technique, and you can read more about this at therightquestion.org. Uh, anytime there's, a, there's a, a closed question, like who wrote the document is a closed question. Once you know the author, there's no more discussion. Uh, Dan teaches kids 
to take every closed question and make it an open question, which requires more thinking and more depth. And so after kids generate their list of questions in teams, might be 20 questions, they have to go through any of the closed ones and make them open. And then kids are asked to rank uh, the importance, pick three questions out of the 20 your teams generate. And where do those questions fall on the list of 20? And you can imagine that most teams are picking their three questions that they think are the most interesting ones after the first 10. Now, we never get to 10 in a class discussion, right? It's, it's, it's hard to get 20 questions generated if you're asking kids in class to all go through the teacher. But in this team-based approach, you can generate lots and lots of questions and uh, – really get to the most interesting ones toward the end. So you're giving kids on the first day of school this taste that to really get to interesting questions, you need to get past your own first 10 or 15 before an interesting one even pops up, given that you're going to be stimulated by the, by the previous ones. So I've just been fascinated by how this pattern holds time and time again. And again, I'm just going to point people to the rightquestion.org. You can go and get their resources and uh, learn a lot more about this. This next slide is uh, Jamie McKenzie's slide. Um, you can see uh, questioning.org is his website. I've known Jamie for a couple of decades. He's a very thoughtful education leader. And he gives kids these definitions of questions. Um, you know, irrelevant, provocative, and so forth. And what fascinates me is I've talked to kids all over the country and shown them this chart. And I, I've asked them to define, you know, what's the difference between these questions? <laughs> Have you ever had a teacher who has shown you all of these different uh, definitions of questions and explain them to you. And most kids say no. Most kids say they've, they've never seen a chart like this. And so this is something I might put up on the wall for the year where, where kids begin to keep track of the kinds of questions they're asking. And teachers do the same thing as well. So if you realize that kids are asking, you know, the same, they're never asking an elaborating question or a hypothetical question or an inventive question, so you, you have this opportunity of not just saying to the class when you're in discussion, okay, who has a question today? You, you can, you can, teachers can be much more directive and, and say, all right, who has a hypothetical question right now? Or who wants to elaborate on a question? And I, I think that's what we're going to need to do, that we're going to need to be more precise and more in-depth about giving kids the nuances of what kind of question to ask given the kind of problem in front of them. Again, this is all going to add up to a lot of content is on the Internet, but if you don't know what question to ask, you're never going to get to the right content. So I'm, I'm just fascinated by uh, the opportunity of teaching kids to be much more sophisticated in developing their, their questioning set. So that's day one. Day one for me is a logical day. Uh, no content, no judgment. It's team-based. Uh, teachers learn a lot about their kids, which also makes sense in the first five days. I think most, again, most educators would agree that uh, the teacher as learner is just one of the most important things you can do in the first five days. You know, who's in front of me? Uh, and this, this is revealing. This will, this will teach teachers a lot about the kinds of questions their kids are asking, different kids, <clears throat> as long as they're uh, carefully listening to these groups as they walk around their room. And again, kids are working harder than their teacher. All right, day two. Now, if you take the questions from day one and, and an educator reviews those questions, 
uh, I think day two is an opportunity for kids to get their own answers. And I've been given workshops on web literacy for the last 25 years, and I'm still struck by how many kids will tell you they know how to use Google and just don't have a clue. Or they don't know how to use Wolfram Alpha Knowledge Engine. You know, that, that also fascinates me that, that lots of kids have never even heard of Wolfram Alpha. Or they don't know how to ask a question over Twitter uh, to get answers from around the world because social media is cut off, you know, in, in a lot of schools. So we have this incredible opportunity to teach kids to get their own answers. But I'm worried that, that a lot of kids don't know how to do that. Uh, and, and I've done lots of workshops on web literacy, so I'm somewhat reluctant uh, to get into it here. But, you know, I could just give a challenge to people listening. You know, do a search right now on um, getting uh, PowerPoint presentations from British universities on Romeo and Juliet right? You know, it's not, not a trick question. And, uh, and because, you know, Shakespeare was British, it turns out there are a lot of scholars in England that put together these fascinating presentations on Romeo and Juliet. And let's go get them, right? But a lot of students will type in Romeo and Juliet PowerPoints you know, just spelled out PowerPoints and British universities. Well, that won't get it for you. That might get you a couple of British universities, uh, but you really need to understand the Google operators. So it's site colon, S-I-T-E colon, then you've got to put in the British University extension, ac.uk for all British universities. Then you need the operator, the Google command called file type, colon, PPT, because that's how we store PowerPoints. And then you type Romeo and Juliet. And, and you got it. But you ask kids, you know, just do that one search. And it's possible there isn't a kid in the school district who knows how to do that search. That freaks me out, that we haven't really taught kids the sophisticated bits of the algorithm that lead to the more precise results rather than random words thrown into Google. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this one because, uh, frankly, I've got a ton of resources on my website at November Learning, and, um, but I'll come back to it if people have questions at, at the end, um, and I can open my screen and show people some tricks if they want on advanced search that we should be teaching. But anyway, day two, we take the questions uh, kids generated. And we say, this is your responsibility. Here are the Googleable questions we asked them the other day. Now, those questions uh, that are Googleable should be arranged that require students to exercise uh, the various advanced search techniques that they can use for the year. But if you don't learn up front, how to find the best information in the world in the first couple of days of school. In fact, if you never learn that, uh, chances are you can go the entire school year and not know you don't know and think you know. And I, sometimes I think kids are over emphasize their skill set in technology when it's really, you know, an inch deep and, and not even very wide. So day two, find your own answers. Okay, day three. Uh, day three, sense responsibility. Uh, I've been convinced by, by very thoughtful educators all over the world that we have underestimated kids' willingness to take more responsibility for contributing to the benefit of all the kids. So this is, this is a cultural aspect that um, and it has to do with kids working harder than their teacher. So probably many of you have kids who uh, used screencasting software 
to design a tutorial, uh, how to explain how something works. Or, or, you, or you have students collaborating on taking notes together, and teachers check those notes, and every day they're put up on the, uh, on the class site so that there are these perfect notes that go all year. Or kids who are researching um, curriculum opportunities, challenges. Uh, for example, I used to teach American history in Lexington, Massachusetts, which, you know, we got a lot of American history there. Um, the kids don't even think about it. They, they just ride their bikes past all those old churches and Lexington Common and, you know, where guys got shot coming out of a barn. Um, and my sense is that if I ask kids uh, to design a tutorial on, um, you know, the American Revolution, that the whole world was going to see, and we'll get, we'll get into this a little later about global connections. There are some kids who would rather design a tutorial or, you know, use Minecraft to build a, an interactive model of, of the church that's on Lexington Green. Uh, and they would spend hours and hours and hours working, working in Minecraft where they might only spend 10, 15, 20 minutes writing a paper on the same event. So I'm convinced that when kids work is for something other than a grade, the responsibility of sharing your knowledge with others that is shared with others, that that is a very powerful, highly motivating challenge for a lot of kids, especially kids who traditionally do not succeed in the current system, um, who aren't good writers, who don't memorize well, who might be special ed, who might be visual learners, you know, those things that traditional classrooms traditionally have not, have not supported. So day three, it's laying out the responsibility that we're going to have this year of creating content that's going to help other people understand what we're studying. And eventually, that, that goes to global publishing, which we're going to get to. So that's my, that's my day three responsibility. Um, and these are, this is just a graphic friend of mine, uh, Sylvia Talisano, put together that just shows some of the jobs. And I think we should give kids jobs. I think uh, we should go back to this, uh, I call this the digital learning farm, where, where the model of a farm is that kids really had jobs. They had real responsibilities. And we kind of lost that as kids have moved off farms and um, don't have real jobs anymore. So I think that has to be restored. That's a sense of dignity and integrity. And there's lots of jobs that we can give kids. In fact, my goal is uh, we could take a teacher out for a cup of coffee and uh, leave classroom for 20 minutes and come back, and class is still operating. Kids are still functioning. They're researching problems around the world. They're creating content. Uh, they're documenting their learning. I, I just think it's incredibly exciting rethinking the job description of kids, specifically with how much responsibility can they take to create content to contribute uh, to the benefit of the whole class. All right. This is a, a tutorial one of the students designed in a class in California, a friend of mine, Eric Marcos. I should have put in the, uh, if you look way at the bottom, the web address is there, mathtrain.com, left-hand corner. Uh, mathtrain.com fascinates me. Uh, this teacher has been working for years in building an entire library of every single problem in sixth grade math. All, all in the voice of kids. Now, I know there's this flip learning movement, and that encourages teachers to make videos so kids can watch the videos teachers make, but that's working too hard. I think kids should make the videos, and there's a lot of research, by the way, that suggests that kids would prefer to listen to a kid voice anyway and not their teacher. Um, 
And I think we've underestimated kids in this regard. As I said earlier, we can challenge kids to create content. You can see this video. It's about a three-minute video explaining how to factor the number 32. Um, the 12-year-old who did it, as you can see here, did it two different ways, using two as a prime number uh, for the first factor set on the left on the blue side, and then she doesn't use a prime number on the right side and the purple. And she realized in testing her tutorial that if you only use a prime number in the first factors, then all, all, all of her friends were trying to find a prime number as a first factor. So she got it that she had to show different ways of factoring 32. As simple as this is, it's, it's a first-time learner appreciating what other first-time learners need. And there's a whole bunch of research on first-time learners that sometimes a first-time learner has the, the sympathy and, and the understanding of how to explain things in a way that a teacher who has a tremendous amount of knowledge and is really, really good doesn't have. Just, they're not a first-time learner. Uh, so I think we should tap first-time learners. All right, day four, problem designer. Uh, this is a tough one for me. Um, I hope I do a good job explaining this. Um, basically, there are two kinds of problems in the world, just to simplify things. One kind of problem is the teacher knows the answer. And uh, those are called well-structured problems. Um, you give kids the right information at the right time, and they then go off and take a test, for example, and they have to demonstrate uh, the application of the knowledge. And it's very well organized. We don't confuse kids. We don't overwhelm them. We don't leave things out. Uh, we make sure that we've got good lesson plans that cover everything. If a student studies, they should get an A. All right, the other kind of problem called messy problem. Messy problem is the opposite. It's not enough information at the right time. It's too much information. You're overwhelmed. You don't even understand the definition of the problem. You might not even have clear rubrics, and uh, it's a mess. Now, the, so my question is, when do we introduce messy problems? When do we challenge kids? that the world doesn't come all tied up in a nice bow with everything organized. When you go out there and solve problems, it's messy. In fact, this is a lesson I got from West Point. Uh, and they realized, because they hire most of their graduates to become army officers, that professors who um, challenge kids, well, cadets, to solve messy problems were much better off as officers in that condition. And I think it doesn't limit to cadets that we should teach kids at all ages to solve messy problems. So here we go. Because teachers have cell phone, uh, say math teacher, which this problem represents, um, teachers can now take photographs very easily of the world around them and put it up on, you know, its learning platform and ask students to, to design problems without giving them a tremendous amount of instruction. In fact, the, the West specifically, West Point teaches its professors to say, involve instead of solve. So if you look at the picture of this cup, uh, that's what was shot out to students. And this, what you're seeing is a response of the first student back to the teacher. And the student put in the radius, the student put in the vertical, and the student invented the ice cube with pretty good dimensions, right? And uh, so the, the student basically says, look, if we have these three ice cubes at this dimension and there's an inch left at the top, you know, is, is it going to overflow? Now, it turns out that's a complicated problem. You have to understand displacement of ice, you know, which is in physics. And, and so 
this is not for every teacher because in this particular situation, uh, another friend of mine did this. It, she had to go and learn about the displacement of ice to be able to apply the geometry that she was teaching. And, and so all of a sudden you have kids designing problems where the teacher who's teaching that subject may, may not be able to actually solve the problem without learning something herself. And that's where the excitement comes in. So just imagine that kids are learners. And most of what teachers teach, they've already learned. So students actually never see teachers learning, even though that's what we want to teach kids is how to learn. So now we have a situation where the teacher has to teach kids how to learn. You know, you can go to Wolfram Alpha and you can look up the displacement ratio, and then you can figure out the application, the geometry of, of the displacement of ice. So it's an amazing example of teachers being challenged by some smart kid in class who comes up with such a creative problem that they, they have to demonstrate how they learn. And I think that's powerful. Uh, an amazing opportunity, again, not for everybody, uh, but for teachers who love to teach how they learn, this is it. Uh, now, what's exciting about a problem like this, especially in social setting, you know, like, like an it's learning platform, all the other kids see what this kid's put up. And that inspires them because they're not all solving the same problem. See, in, in traditional well-organized problems, there's no opportunity for kids to apply their imagination and their curiosity. Problems already been designed for them. And so what we really need to do is teach kids to become problem designers, and that's day four. Lots of, uh, similar to asking questions on day one, but it's the application of questions uh, to specific content area in the curriculum, teaching kids to become problem designers uh, day four. I'll be very interested to hear um, questions and, and resources our, the audience has around teaching kids to become problem designers, because I think that's just one of the most exciting things we can do now. All right, day five, global collaboration. Uh, you know, if I go back to teach American history, I'm, I'm pretty well certain <laughs> that the British don't teach the same story as we do. Uh, they have a completely different version of events, you know, why we even had the revolution. Um, and I was actually in England on July 4th uh, one year, you know, doing some workshops. And, you know, my friend who picked me up at the airport asked me what I want to do that. You're not going to believe this. I, I said, yeah, I'd love to see the fireworks. And he looks at me like, you know, I'm an idiot, which I was. And he said, well, no, we don't really celebrate, you know, have the fireworks. Um, so the, the whole opportunity, uh, when you're teaching the American Revolution, I think we should teach different points of view. And if you notice in the parentheses I put down there, the extension of schools in England is sch.uk. So you could type in schools in England, American Revolution. You probably won't find any. But if you type in Google site colon sch.uk, American Revolution, you'll only find schools in England with that content. So this is another example of, you know, teaching kids to be precise, but it's also incredibly exciting when you show kids a whole different point of view than what we're teaching. I think that's powerful. A lot of kids become fascinated by that. You know, what are the, how come the British are saying that? That can't be right. And uh, so not only is it just a good skill, um, to understand global empathy and different points of view in the world, but it also can be quite motivating and, and have kids, you know, really psyched to read more, write more, especially if you connect lives, right? You know, if you have a debate uh, with kids in England, you know, over any one of the free video conferencing tools and kids have to, you know, pre-think the questions they're going to ask and, and how they're going to, you know, line up if the teachers have created a debate. I think more kids will prepare 
with more diligence for a debate with kids in England than are going to prepare for a, a test. Uh, I'd love to be challenged on that, but that, that, that's my sense. Um, we got to go global. Now, this particular screen, you're looking at a um, AM, those, those, those times from the bottom up, that's 3.11 a.m. to 8.15 a.m. This happens to be the um, back end of my friend's website in California with Math Train, you know, kids creating those tutorials. And it just shows uh, different countries at the bottom, starting with Australia, ending with Australia, you know, Dubai, and so forth. And... What, what's really interesting is when you show kids that the work they're doing is being valued all over the world, that, that can be another powerful moment uh, that actually can motivate kids to do even more work. So I'm showing you this because I was with these kids, and my friend, the teacher in the classroom, had, had never shown them the back end of his website that shows traffic from around the world. So I said, look, you, you guys are pretty popular all over the world. That was just in three hours, five hours this morning while you were sleeping. And uh, they didn't believe me. They, they said, no, nah, we don't have people from all over the world. They don't care about our stuff. I said, yeah, they do. They really do. And so this one girl, she's, she's in this meeting with me, 12-year-old girl, and she walks away. And I said, hey, hey, you can't walk away. You're having a meeting. I can't let you go. And she said, no, I got to go. I said, well, why do you have to go right now? And she points back at that list of all those countries who have looked at her stuff. And she says, I just found out the world needs me. I have got to make more stuff right now. I've got to get to work. <laughs> so absolute true story. Uh, not every kid, but there's enough that uh, you give them a global audience and you show them that their work is being valued. And for some kids, it's more motivating than getting a grade. So off we go. World needs me. Go figure, right? I don't know. I just think it's incredibly exciting. Um, all of this is to say teachers are more important than ever. It's, it's, I think we're going to do less content. I think uh, there's no question in my mind that over time, the value of a teacher's knowledge as a transfer process is going to go down. The value of a teacher in understanding how to motivate kids and what resources and connections to make for kids is going to go up. You know, teaching kids to ask questions and make a contribution and solve messy problems and learning how to learn, I think those skills are, are going to go up because so much content, as I said at the beginning, is just available at your fingertips if you know how to use it. So if I suggested in any part of this that teachers are less important, that is absolutely not, that's not my intent at all. I actually think these are more sophisticated and more difficult skills to teach than telling a class what you already know. So at that point, I'd love to turn it back over to Andrew and Jill and uh, take a look at your questions after we, uh, we, we hear from Jill a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, Alan, for such an important discussion today. And thank you to our audience for your participation. Before we start the Q&A, I want to mention a few ways it's learning support student engagement in K-12 classrooms. It's Learning provides tools to support a variety of teaching strategies, including universal design for learning, project-based learning, and blended learning. Flexible tools allow students to create and analyze, not just consume. Students can also collaborate in group folders or in communities. If you would like to access our resources on student engagement and other topics, visit itslearning.com. I will now hand things over to Andrew for the Q&A. 
All right. Well, thank you, Jill, and thank you, Alan, for a great discussion about those all-important first five days. Now, we still have uh, about 15 minutes left, uh, and we do have some questions that have come in from the audience, so let's turn to those. And, Alan, I'm going to come back to you straight off the bat and uh, draw on some of your experience having worked in about 40 countries. And we have a, a question from Danny who says that you know, he's working in a third-world country where access to information and the web is limited at best. Uh, and so he's asking, how would you suggest encouraging responsible research? Uh, he said that you know, over the last two years, he's encouraged the why questions in all areas, but he finds that pupils are becoming discouraged uh, when it's difficult to find abstract answers. Uh, in your experience traveling around and working with educators, what, what would you say about that? Uh, Alan, are you on mute? You might have put yourself on mute by mistake. Alan, have we still got you, uh, or are you still on mute? Right. Fortunately, we seem to have lost Alan for a moment. Let me see if I can bring him up. Uh, I have a feeling that Alan has put himself on mute. Uh, Jill, in the meantime, would you uh, like? Have you had a chance to? You know, listening to what Alan had to say, um, you know, how, you know, and the sort of the approach for the five days, do you have any insight on how technology can help students in gaining these important skills? Have you uh, had any experience in doing that on your side? Um, thank you, Andrew. Yes, I think, um, as Alan mentioned, I think any time you give kids the ability to learn from each other, um, and to work in groups and then also have that uh, global connection. So Alan was mentioning the use of Twitter and social media and ways to reach out and um, gather information and viewpoints from different areas of the world. I think that's really important. Um, and I think that um, having the right technology and the right tools can uh, certainly help that happen for kids. Okay. Uh you know, one of the one of the things that uh, the, the vision that Alan laid out, and I, I hope we do get him uh, back on in a second. Um, there are a couple of areas, and once again, Jill, I don't want to put you on the spot as someone who has, who I've got at the at the moment. But there are some areas of the kind of education that Alan is proposing, where uh, I would be I would love to talk about. Um, faculty development and how you make that shift of faculty who've been doing something a particular way for many years, how you get them to change the way they're doing things. That's certainly one area where I think we need to, to talk to Alan. And if you have anything to say on that, uh, please chime in. And the other area is this whole idea that, you know, when I talk to educators, a lot I hear about is tremendous time crunch and there's this constant pressure on assessment. And Alan's vision for education is phen phenomenal and, and it's enlightening and it's and, and invigorating. But I, there's also I'm back, sense Andrew. that I'd look. Aha, Alan, you are here. Thank you. Uh, I don't know hey, if you could hear anything. Oh, I was, uh, that's, that's fine. I'm glad you made it back. Um, I'm going to come back. I was just talking to Jill about this. Is you know, yeah. I, I was just talking about how enlightening and, and uh, inspiring your vision of education is. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about this issue of, you know, when I talk to educators, there's uh, always a tremendous sense of, of time pressure and assessment pressure. And how yeah. do you square the two things? Perfect. And when you talk to educators, what do you think? Yeah. Well, the two teachers I highlighted, um, the one who teaches messy problems, her name is Jessica Cavaness. She teaches at Capel High School outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, Jessica has to cover the curriculum uh, like any other geometry teacher. These problems, the messy problems, they're just extra credit. They're just, if kids want to do it, they can go ahead and um, design their own problems. What's fascinating is Jessica was Teacher of the Year. Um, and 
she had this incredible increase in test scores because kids saw problems all over the world. In fact, after she starts taking pictures, they start taking pictures. And they ask if they can post them and post challenges for kids. And, and you know, for people who have to cover content, you know, class ends. And maybe kids are never going to look at that subject again. And what's fascinating to me, because I know, Jessica, we've become friends over this, um, she told me in the second year she had to get kids to log off of her website because last year's kids were solving her challenges for the next year. And that's a problem a lot of teachers don't have. You know, last year's kids are so psyched and so pumped up about designing problems. So your assessment can actually go up, not down. My other friend in L.A. who has math train, you know, Eric, um, has the highest test scores in his district. And he didn't. He was, you know, he just didn't. And he skyrocketed because the first-time learner, you know, creating content for first-time learners is powerful. And not only that, but kids designing tutorials will, will say that you have to learn more in order to teach somebody else. So I'm, I'm not concerned about covering the curriculum and any loss on, on assessment. I think we're going to have increases if we do this. All right, good. All right, well, thank you. And I'm going to come back to, I think, I'm going to come back to the question where I think we lost you originally, which was a, a question yeah. uh, um, from Danny, which is, who's, I don't know if you heard, it was talking about uh, he, he teaches in a third world country where access yeah. to information and the web is limited. Did you hear the whole question? I did, and I don't have a great answer for him. Uh, you know, the world's not fair, we all know, and, um, you know, if kids have cell phones there, I've been to a number of third world countries where they do, then certainly uh, teaching them how to use their cell phone, if there's, I mean, I've been in uh, South Africa and townships, you know, with the most awful poverty I've personally ever seen, um, and the principal has one line, and kids can go into the principal's office once a week, and and they do. So uh, I, I don't know if it's worse than that. Um, it's frustrating. It's not fair. Uh, and we just, you know, we'll have to do what we have to do. But even if that means making the principal's office that has the one phone line, you know, available for kids to do some research. All right. And uh, I'm now going to shift back to uh, a, a question that I was posing to Jill when, when we lost uh, when while you were away. And it comes mm -hmm. back, and we also have a question from the audience from Jan. It's talking about you know, making, getting, teaching teachers to be better facilitators and, and letting go mm -hmm. of control of, at the front of the class. You know, in your mm -hmm. experience working with schools, how do you make that? change among the faculty? How do you get them to uh, take on a new approach? Well, there are different ways. So I'll just name a couple. Um, one is to have kids involved in staff development. Very often, I think, um, we're teaching teachers new tools, processes, and, and there's no kids in the workshop. So we never really get to classroom management stuff because there's no kids to manage in the workshop. So I think it makes sense to bring kids into the workshop. And in fact, to have to teach the kids. So let's say every teacher brings two kids, whatever it is, and uh, the kids learn. And the teacher's job is to sit there and watch mm -hmm. their students learn, whether it's an app or, or a creative tool, uh, and take notes for teachers to take notes and, and really understand the experience these kids are having uh, and for teachers to make these observations. And at some point, kids can go if you want, but let, let's say the kids then, then leave later and teachers share what they saw and, and they share uh, opportunities, new opportunities of empowering kids. So I, I think it starts with our, with our staff development. The other, the other thing 
I think is important is this sense of empowerment, I think, needs to go all the way through the organization, from leadership, you know, all the way through. So for teachers to design some of their own staff development, you know, to empower teachers to be more responsible for their own assessments, their own evaluations, their own how do you improve teach your own work. Um, so it, I think it has to happen on multiple levels of, um, you know, of application. Okay. All right. Um, I just wanted to follow up on something you said, I think it was on the day one, you were talking about the importance of learning skills and not content mm -hmm. and, you know, with the mm -hmm. availability of content at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. Can you, you know, one of the challenges at that point is, is you know, is when, when, when students see content, um, you know, are they going to just take that content? And how does that work with the issues of plagiarism and, and so on, where, they, where the, the, they might be developing skills but maybe are not understanding uh, the, the underlying properties of content itself, which seems to be just lying everywhere for them to use? How do you, how do you approach that? Yeah. Well, let me make it worse before we answer it. Um, I'm fascinated by a study, Stanford, released uh, last winter where they interviewed 7,900 students from middle school through university, including Stanford, on showing them different aspects of fake news, what they call fake news. So your search on Google, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and it turns out that the best any group did at validating whether something was true or false the very, very best, was at Stanford at about 30%. So you can imagine 70% of students at Stanford walking around can't tell the difference between whether something's true or false on the Internet. So we don't measure that, right? We, we um, don't have an assessment for that. But what worries me, I mean, plagiarism certainly worries me, and that, that's a pretty straightforward you know, there are tools to know where do things originate. Um, and we ought to teach kids the ethics of, of using content. That, that, that should be given. And librarians are really good at that, and, and we can build staff development for teachers. What worries me is we live in a society where a lot of people can easily be manipulated into thinking something is true because social media and the web have become our dominant media, but we're not teaching kids critical thinking in that media. We're still teaching critical thinking yeah. as it relates to reading paper. And uh, that, that's my biggest concern is that we're going to lose democracy one day. Well, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about maybe one last question. Let's talk, talk about the skills and, and the Internet skills and how, how students are researching information. And come back to the Google search, and you use the, the example of a PowerPoint presentation in Britain. And, and one of the audience members wanted to know, you know, if they wanted to teach their students more about how to do effective Google searches, where would mm -hmm. they uh, where do, where would they go? Where would you suggest they go to find out what mm -hmm. some of those hidden sort of talent skills are that they could pick up? Yeah, I've actually written some articles for eSchool News on advanced Google search that we should put in the follow up uh, mailing. Okay. Um, but if they want to go right now, uh, they can Google Google, literally Google <laughs> Google, and the word operator because Google calls these commands operators, and, and maybe the word guide. So three word search, Google operator guide. And at the top, you will find Google websites that define the Google operators. Giving examples, um, so every student should have a cheat sheet. You know, let's, just, let's just say what it is. Like a dictionary is a cheat sheet. You know, you get to find out you know, what does that word mean? Just a big cheat sheet. And the thesaurus is a cheat sheet. And I, and I, and I think we should teach kids there's a cheat sheet for 
Google operators, and you ought to know how, how this thing works that you use every day. Or you could type in Power Search with Google as a search. And Google has a couple of free online courses. If you're a different kind of learner, like more audio, because it's a, kind of a lecture format where you can listen to, begin to help you think about how do you design search. For, for example, right now, if, if half the audience typed in, are cats better than dogs? And the other half of the audience typed in, are dogs better than cats? You'd have a big fight because depending on how you design the search, are cats better than dogs, I can guarantee you all of your results will be that cats are much better than dogs. And if you just flip those words, dogs are so much better than cats. Irrefutable <laughs> data. <laughs> so, so, so just teaching kids that the algorithm is not designed to get you the best information in the world, that's not the point of this thing. The, the point of this thing is to get you the information the algorithm thinks you want. And so once you show kids that, and then you say, by the way, when you search all year, how you design a query is going to give you biased results, then you have to teach them how to design queries that give you the least biased results. That's terrific. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm pretty, we're going to have to wrap it up at that point. Uh, you know, thank you, thank you, Alan, for a, really a great discussion about these all important first five days, and, and thank you, Jill, for providing some important background on its learning. Um, you know, I also want to, you know, as we wrap up, I want to thank eSchool Media. I mean, eSchool Media would like to thank its learning for its support today. Um, and one final reminder before the audience signs off, uh, we, we will be sending out an email to all attendees when the recording of the webinar is ready. So thank you, and this concludes today's webcast. Goodbye. <laughs>